I'm attempting to complete every single GameCube game, and I'm using a random number generator to pick the next game. Last episode, we played football with all the backyard kids in backyard football. And in this episode, we're a spy in one of the strangest worlds in video game history and playing Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes. Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes was released on March 9th, 2004, and was developed and published by Konami Entertainment, with some help from Silicon Knights. This game really surprised me how much I ended up liking it by the end. Before we get started, make sure to like this video because it helps out the channel, and subscribe if you're new so you don't miss any of the future games we play. Without further ado, this is my experience with Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes. In Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes, we're going to go through the story to consider this one complete. This game, however, opens very different than anything that we've played so far. When you boot up the game, the opening cutscene is actually important to the game and isn't just showing the game off like most games did during this era. So first things first, we meet a bunch of characters for the story and meet the main character, Solid Snake. We also get shot out of a submarine and a missile with scuba gear on. I don't think this would actually work, but I was very happy with the opening of this game. Then we get to the main menu of the game and get to decide to start a new game. We're going to play on normal difficulty because I have never played a Metal Gear Solid before. I want to add this disclaimer here. I'm going to briefly touch base on story parts and even cut out some of the smaller stuff altogether so this video isn't like 3 hours long. So if you want to know anything else I left out, I would recommend playing the game because there is a lot of stuff that happens during this game. When we start the actual game, we start by getting out of the water where Snake was shot in using that missile from the opening cutscene. This is why I think it's important to watch that opening, because you get a background of what is happening in the game. This cutscene shows us being inside some sort of military base and shows a bunch of guards that are patrolling the only exit out of the area. But before we get to do any type of gameplay, we get a video call from the colonel, on some crazy video technology where we have our own radio station basically and we could see the character that we're talking to. This is also how we're going to save the game in the future. These calls are mainly used to explain the story with lore or what Snake is supposed to do next. I think some of the conversations that you have on this device don't seem all that important, but I'm not too sure I didn't read all of them. Anyways, the colonel tells us we have to sneak past the guards and get to the elevator to get out of the room. And then we're able to finally play a snake. If you didn't know what Metal Gear Solid was, I'm going to give you a quick breakdown of the gameplay. For the most part, you're going to want to sneak around because when the alarms are set off, there will be millions of enemies coming after you, and you have to hide somewhere until the alarm meter goes back to normal. However, you are given a handful of different weapons throughout the story, and you can take down some enemies that way. If done quick enough, then they won't set off the alarm, and you don't have to worry about alerting the other guards. Outside of that, we have to avoid being seen by cameras, and we can hide in a box. There are also rations on the ground that we can pick up, which will heal us if we take any damage, which I did a lot of in this playthrough. All right, good. I think we've covered the basics of the game, and now we can start moving through the story and talking about some of the boss fights along the way. Once we figure out how to play, we activate the elevator and make our way up out of the starting room. Once we take the elevator up, we take off our scuba gear, and we finally get a look at our main character's face. He's a young fella with a black ribbon around his head. Outside of that, he wears a lot of gray. I mean, a lot of gray. This guy couldn't be any more neutral. We also get this flash of a blonde guy, but there isn't much context to it at this point. When we get control of Snake again, we're on a helicopter pad and we have to find a way into this military fortress. So the best way to do this is through the heating and cooling ducts. On my first attempt at this, we set off the camera and got a bunch of guards trying to kill us. Some of them show up with a shield on their gun and we can't really do anything about it yet because we don't even have a gun. I did like that we could throw people over the railing in this area. But eventually we couldn't do anything else but fight, and I ended up climbing into the back of a truck and hiding behind a box of supplies. This is the only way to get the radar to calm down and go back to normal so we can advance the game. This ends up being super annoying sometimes because I'm just trying to get through an area to get to a place I need to be, 
and then they lock it down and I have to mess around with it forever just to make it to the other side. After messing around with this area for a while, we find a duct we can crawl through and start making our way into the fortress. Finally. When you start crawling through the ducts, the game turns into first person. This is a good feature because being in third person here would make it so hard to figure out what you were supposed to do next. We get a call from our master trainer guy or something as we're crawling through. We also find out that the DARPA chief is being held in a holding cell on the first floor of the basement. And that someone else is sneaking around the fortress besides us. We come out of the vents and we're in the tank hangar. A place that we're going to go through a bunch of times throughout this playthrough of the game. It's nothing special, but when we get inside, I immediately set off the alarm and have to deal with a bunch of guards shooting me. Once we die and try again, we're able to find the elevator that takes us down to the first floor basement. Hop inside and make our way down. On to the holding cells area. This is a small area and doesn't have much we can do here at the moment, besides make our way into the vents once again. While crawling through the vents, we get the first of many bathroom pee scenes in this game, because they love adding these in the game. I'm going to point out all of the ones I noticed during our playthrough, so this is number one. The next opening in the vent, we see this female prisoner working out on her bed. We have no idea who she is at this point, so we quickly just carry on moving through the vents. We find the DARPA chief in the holding cell and bust inside to talk to him. We pop in to save him. We find out that there are people there trying to activate the Metal Gear. He's also very suspicious of us. But he explains that the Metal Gear is a robot that they're trying to activate because of nuclear war or something. Then out of nowhere, the camera gets all crazy and the DARPA chief starts like freaking out and having some issues going on with his body. Then his eyes get all bloodshot and he falls over and dies. He randomly had a heart attack right in front of us. The woman from the other cell hears what is going on and then it cuts back to us just saying like, yep, dead. Snake has no emotions. Pretty funny though. The door to the holding cell is open and when we walk outside of the cell, we see a guard in a pretty awkward position. Then a gun gets put in our back. How does a super spy fall for this exactly? We have a stare off with this guard and the guard is just in the background hanging out so it takes all the tension away from the scene. Then some other guards show up and we finally get to use a gun for the first time. The person that held the gun to us doesn't shoot anyone and is actually pretty useless during this fight. I would have liked to say that this part was really good but it felt weird getting used to shooting and I didn't realize I could switch to first person to shoot at this point in the game. Once we take out all of the guards, we get this cutscene where the person holding us at gunpoint leaves and we find out that it's the woman from the other cell and she begins shooting at us before getting on the elevator and taking off. Then we call and save our game. I figured I would show this one time during the playthrough so you understand how it works. Next up we have to go to the second floor of the basement which is called the armory and it's exactly what you think it is. We find some C4 in a locker in one of the rooms randomly. Then we find what looks like a patched wall and we use the C4 to blow a giant hole in the wall. This leads us to Armory South, which triggers a cutscene for the next boss fight of the game. And there is a lot that takes place in this cutscene. The boss fight and the cutscene follow following the boss fight. So let's go through it. The cutscene opens with someone being tied up with a bunch of explosive wires everywhere. If we touch them, they will blow up. As we're examining the situation, someone shoots at us and Snake goes into slow-mo matrix bullet dodging mode. This is when I discovered that Snake is the most athletic person I have ever seen. And I mean ever. The things that he does during this game is insane. Anyways, once we dodge the bullet, it shows us who shot the gun. And with the flashiest display of spinning a gun around and doing tricks with it for way longer than it needed to be, we find out that he's Special Operations Foxhound's Revolver, or Ocelot. Go figure that's his name, considering when he tells us this, he's still spinning the gun around. Then, after a bit of back and forth, we get into the actual boss fight with him. This fight is actually really easy. You have to run around in a square and shoot at him. The camera works against you if you stay in third-person mode, 
but overall you just run around and shoot at him until his health goes all the way down. The only real thing to worry about is running into the wires that will go off and blow up the man tied up, which is a really bad thing. But besides that, this boss fight is simple and nothing of extreme importance takes place during it, but when it's over, a lot of stuff happens. First we go into a face off in the room and Ocelot tells us that we're good and he's not surprised since we have the same code name as the boss. And then he tells us that he's just warming up and then comes out of cover to shoot us when all of a sudden his hand gets cut off. It seems to be out of nowhere but if you were watching closely you can see the moment of something in front of him. This leads into the next crazy part. We find out someone is in the room but is invisible and then they destroy all the explosive without killing the man in the middle. I don't know how they achieve this, but somehow it works. It's a really cool scene, but I still don't know how it works. Then we get a cutscene showing us what the person looks like. We don't get much information besides that they're using stealth camouflage. Then we get into a fight with this ninja person, and is one of the coolest cutscenes in the game. The ninja comes after us, and we shoot at it, and they're blocking our bullets with their sword. Then they attack us with the sword. We defend for a minute, then the ninja jumps up and cuts a chunk of the ceiling out, and then Pele soccer kicks it at us, which Snake is able to dodge himself using some major parkour skills. This is only the beginning of him doing this, but it's crazy how good he is. We end up getting into a stalemate at the end, and the ninja just leaves and says he'll be back again to fight us. Once all the excitement is done, we can finally talk to the man that was tied up, and we find out that he's the president of the fortress and they've tortured him. He told them the information they wanted. He then gives us a card to get better access to rooms in the fortress, talks about his involvement with the Metal Gear project, and then proceeds to have a heart attack as well. Right when we're trying to get information out of him too. Are these people like allergic to snake? Once the president dies, we can access a new room in the armory, and we crawl under some invisible wires and collect a new weapon called the FAMAS. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a machine gun, so higher rate of fire than our pistol at the moment. We call the woman that escaped from us because the president had her number for some reason, and we find out that her name is Mariel, and she wants to help us. So we agree to have her open the big car cargo door in the tank hangar. We find out that the colonel is our uncle too, which will come up a bit later in the game. After hanging out with Mariel, we head back to the tank hangar and make our way through the cargo doors. Just to find invisible lasers that if we set off, we'll lock the cargo bay and release poison and we will die. Using our cigarettes, the smoke will show us where the lasers are. And we can just walk under them and safely get to the other side and out into the cold tundra that connects the tank hangar to the nuke building. When we get outside, we get a call from a person that is just static, but tells us that there's claymore mines in the snow, and to be careful. He also refers to himself as Deep Throat. They know exactly what they were doing in this dialogue. We get about halfway through the snow and get a cutscene of a tank, and this giant man comes out the top and basically is like, I'm one with the ravens, my dude, but in a manly, muscular voice then goes back in the tank and tries to murder Snake. This boss fight is pretty easy as well, but the controls were working against me here. To break down the fight in the easiest way possible, the tank has a gunner that comes out of the top and shoots at us. We have to throw a grenade into his lap and then it explodes to do damage. This is easier said than done, and once we take down one, there is another one. And then we have to do the same thing. We can damage the tracks of the tank with missed grenades, and we can also use like an EMP grenade to temporarily stun the tank in place. That's the whole fight, taking a shot from the cannon of the tank does a ton of damage, and the machine guns can cause a lot of damage quickly. I think that's the boss fight as a whole though. And once we finish the fight, we get a cutscene where the tank tries to line us up, and we throw a pulled grenade into the cannon of the tank and it lands perfectly in front of the raven man and blows up. This destroys the tank and one of the gunners get launched out into the snow and has a level 3 key card. So we can open even more doors and we walk away like nothing happened. How does he have this level of accuracy? Is Snake a professional baseball player? What is happening here? 
This allows us to make our way into the nuke building, find an elevator, and move on to the first floor of that building. While exploring, we came across our second guy taking a piss in the bathroom. I just let him leave, but I wanted to point it out. Number two for this game. In one of the rooms, we find the Nikita, which is a missile launcher that allows us to control the missile we shoot. Pretty cool weapon, just shoots too slow for my liking. We move down to the second floor of the basement of the nuke building, and we find this hallway that is covered in gas and the floor is electrified. So how do we solve that problem? We enter the room and then control the Nikita missile into the other room and blow up the electrical center to shut off the floor. The only problem is that while we're standing in there, we can only hold our breath for so long, so you have to make sure the shots count, or you have to leave and come back. When flying the missile, there are cameras with guns on them. Those cameras will try to shoot down our missiles, so you kind of have to blow them up before you're able to destroy the electrical box. Once we destroy it, the floor turns off and we can move down the hallway of the room and into the area that isn't being flooded with poison gas. We get this really good cutscene where all the guards are in the hallway are being taken out one by one by some invisible force. All the guards are taken out in cool ways and Snake sort of just watches it all happen from the other room. This is a good cutscene as well. Once the killing takes place, we get control of Snake again and head into the room that the invisible force enters. This takes us into another cutscene that shows the ninja from before yelling at this scientist and threatening him, which causes him to pee his pants. Does this count as another pee scene in this game? I'm going to count this one, so we're at lucky number three. Anyways, after that happens, we come inside and the ghost explains he wants to fight us like old times and we don't have much choice but to fight him. This fight is interesting. The fight starts off with a ninja trying to kill us and we have to shoot him. But the problem is that he blocks all of our shots so we have to EMP grenade him because the suit will stop working for the moment and allow us to get a couple shots in. Once we do a bit of damage we get another little cutscene where he says we should fight him like a man and we have to start just like fist fighting him instead of shooting him. This actually makes this part much easier and I liked it a lot more. When we get his health to about half, we get another cutscene where he wants to play hide and seek and we have to find him in the room while he's invisible. This is really easy because the room is pretty small and you can kind of just see him there. Once you find him, you just continue to beat him up with punches and kicks. Then once we have him and about a fourth of his health left, we get another cutscene where he's begging us to continue to fight him. He's some sort of masochist. Oh look, Mario and Yoshi statues on the computer. Finally, once you get his health all the way down, we get a cutscene where we have another cool fighting exchange. We kick him in the stomach. It appears like the suit is going crazy. He screams like something about medicine and then he leaves. It's very strange. Then we get a call and find out that his name is Gray Fox and him and Snake have a history in the past. So it all comes together. We then have a conversation with the scientist after we get him out of the closet thing. He tells us what he does, more about the Metal Gear project, it zooms in on Mario and Yoshi. He tells us to call him Octacon or something, I don't know why. And that he can also go invisible with his camouflage. But then he decides to leave but tells us that we can call him at any time if we need food or ammo. So he's actually going to live and be helpful, hopefully. Then he walks away and the cutscene ends. We head back to the bathroom on floor one and Mario is able to sneak up on us again for the second time in this game. We're supposed to be the best spy, but she gets us twice. She talks to us for a minute and yells at us for looking at her butt. I don't know why this was added, but yeah, Snake, be respectful. We head into the main room on floor one and we get this cutscene where Mario is acting weird, like something is wrong with her. We move into the office room and Mario won't let us leave for some reason and something comes over her where she's trying to hit on us out of nowhere. We deny her because we learned our lesson and we see an invisible person flying around and Snake decides that beating up Mario is the way to go. This begins the most iconic boss fight from this game with Psycho Mantis. Everyone likes this boss fight, but I honestly didn't care for this one while playing through. Once we beat her down enough, Mantis comes out of hiding and he tries to mess with us. 
One of my favorite things is how the photos of real people on the wall start to freak out and do strange things. I wasn't expecting this, but it's amazing. I'm going to try and sum up this boss fight the best I can while skipping over a bunch of it. So in this boss fight, Mantis is able to tap into your controller and you have to switch the controller into another port in the GameCube so that you can actually hit him. While all this is going on, he's messing with the stuff in the room, like the pitchers will hit you, he'll throw chairs at you, among other stuff. But when we switch controllers, we're able to shoot him without him blocking it. It's because he's supposed to be reading our mind. When the screen turns gray, you know that you need to switch the controller into another port of the GameCube. He can also make the screen black so you can't see. Anyways, that's pretty much sums up what he does during the fight. Once we get his health to about half, he's like, why can't I control your mind? He forces Mariel to get back up and have her shoot at us. You can't kill her, so we have to run over and punch and kick her until we knock her out again. After we knock her down, Mantis gets really upset and he forces her to attempt to shoot herself. We have to yet again knock her out so she doesn't do that. It seems a bit extra for this boss fight, but I understand the tension of the situation. After all that, we can then finish killing Mantis, which we do in the next area, and he flops out of floating and lands on the ground. I was so happy to be done with this boss fight. After the fight, we get a cutscene where he tells us about his tragic life and how people are fated to bring pain and misery. We get a really close up on his face and he looks like Voldemort. He's the weirdest looking person. I want to know why he looks like this. Tell me, Kojima. Mantis asks us to put his mask back on so that he can die in peace and that's the end of the boss fight. In the next area, we head through some caves and Snake talks about wolf dogs being half wolf, half husky. I don't know why this was weird to me, but I thought it was. We have to sneak past the dogs in this area and I did everything in my power to not kill any of the dogs because it's not their fault. We make it to the underground passage and Meryl is about to show us where all the mines are without any equipment and she walks this path that we need to follow so we don't blow up when we walk. She either knows something we don't, or she has like a sixth sense for this. Once we get past it, we get this crazy cutscene where Mariel has a red dot on her, and then she gets shot by Sniper Wolf like four times. She bleeds everywhere. I'm not sure how she doesn't like kill her right now, like she's just bleeding out. She then tells us to leave her there, and that we need to stay alive and move on without her. We don't take that as an answer and we run all the way back to the armory to pick up our own sniper rifle called the PSG-1. This weapon packs a crazy punch, but when you equip it, it forces us to look down the scopes. So we can't just run around with it. Sort of annoying. After getting it, we run all the way back to the area where Mario got sniped to save her. But when we get back there, she is gone and we have to just kill Sniper Wolf. This boss fight is a joke. Because all you need to do is lay down in the area with the mines and look down the scopes and shoot her until she's dead. I was expecting so much more from this boss fight to be honest. We head down to the other end of the room and go to scale the tower when we're confronted by three guards. We're able to handle them with no problem until Sniper Wolf shows up again. She's unharmed so I don't really understand but she basically tells us she has our scent and that she never misses a target once she has their scent. She walks away and we pass out from something. I don't know if the guards hit us or something, but it sort of just happens. When we wake back up, we're locked down to this machine and we meet the blonde guy from the beginning of the game. He then drops a major bombshell on us and tells us that we're brothers and his name is Liquid Snake. Bum bum bum! Sniper Wolf comes over to us and fondles us for no reason. What is her problem? We don't want you. Stop taking advantage of Snake. Once she tells us Mario is alive, Ocelot decides he wants to torture us, but gives us a tutorial on how to survive being shocked. We just have to hit the A button a bunch while it's happening. The following cutscene shows us in a locked room, almost like a nice version of the holding cells, and in the corner is the DARPA chief. But this one is decaying way more than he should be since he died a few hours ago. We think this is weird, but don't understand what's happening. We call the scientist to help us, but he just shows up, gives us ketchup, and leaves. Snake is very strong, though, because he's able to pick him up through the bars of the door. Strongman Snake over here. 
The guard watching our cell has a stomach flu and we get our fourth bathroom joke gag in this game because he runs off like he's going to poop himself. During this time, we're supposed to hide under the bed in the room. So when he returns, he thinks we're gone and he opens the door and comes inside. We get this to work to perfection and have to run outside of the room and beat up the guard with our fist. Once he's knocked out, we can go into the torture room and get all of our stuff back from behind the machine, I guess. I don't know how any of this works. Then we can just leave. This leads us out to the holding cells from the beginning of the game, and it's all coming full circle. Again, we have to go back to where Mariel got shot, and we have flashbacks from that event that happened like an hour ago. Snake feels really guilty about it, and we tell the colonel that we will go save his niece. We will not let her die. We head to the door to finally climb the tower after the extra stuff the game added. And this is when we have to change to disc 2. Disc 2 opens with Snake having to go to the top of a communications tower. This is the part of the game that was discovered to have a glitch for speedrunners in the PS1 version. But basically you just have to climb up the stairs forever while the guards are attempting to kill you. I felt like this part lasted way too long. Once we make it to the top, we have to climb up a ladder to get to the rooftop of the building. And then once we reach the rooftops, we're looking to cross over to the second tower to go down that one. When a helicopter shows up and blows up the big communication disc, and it causes this massive explosion. Snake has to run backwards, then we realize that Liquid is in the helicopter. And he's basically telling us that he's going to kill us, where we stand, we have a limited amount of time to decide to tie up a rope and rappel down the building. But before we can do this safely, Liquid starts to shoot at us and we do some more matrix dodging over the railing of the tower and avoid all the shots. I mentioned it before, but Snake is the best athlete ever. This transitions into us rappelling down the building while avoiding getting shot by the helicopter. Once we get close to the crosswalk, about halfway down the building, we get shot and have to abandon repelling and jump off the wall during some parkour moves on our way down to the balcony. On the far side of the balcony, there are a bunch of soldiers we can't see because it's dark, so we have to either use the sniper or the Nikita to take them down before we can advance any further. Killing them gives us access to communication tower B, when we get near the elevator, we see Octacon, and he says he'll work on fixing the elevator while we head back up to the rooftops to take care of the helicopter and Liquid Snake. This boss fight is actually really easy to be honest. He flies around and tries to shoot us, and we have to pull out our missile launcher, or the stinger is what it's called, and let it lock onto him and fire. That's it for the whole boss fight. As long as you don't stand in place, the fight doesn't get much harder than that. At the very end of the fight, once the helicopter is about to go down, Liquid shoots the gas containers in the middle of the roof, and I didn't know that this was even there, so I almost died at the very end. But I was able to survive, and we get this crazy cutscene. The whole thing is insane. Liquid shoots a missile at us, and we just jump on top of it as it, it's about to hit us, and we just redirect it. And then we shoot the helicopter again with a missile, causing it to crash. The dialogue in this cutscene is amazingly bad, but it's also super funny. Snake tells Liquid he'll see him in hell, and then walks away from the explosion like cool guys do, and then gives the line, that takes care of the cremation. What a strange and amazing line. We head back down Tower B and the elevator is fixed, but we find out that there are four invisible guards inside of it, and we need to take them out to move forward. Finally, we're at the bottom of Tower B, and we walk outside in the snow. And as Snake begins to move forward, he has to dodge a sniper shot. From literally out of nowhere. And, you wouldn't guess who that sniper shot's from. No other than Sniper Wolf. And those instincts take over, and he's able to just dodge. This boss fight with Sniper Wolf is exactly the same as the one before, but this time we're off to the side a bit and Sniper Wolf runs and hides behind trees between us shooting her. This was another easy fight and we finished the boss fight and get another crazy cutscene. We hit her in the chest with a shot and then when we come out of cover she shoots our gun away from us. 
It looks like we're in big trouble, but superstar athlete Snake does some crazy backflip move, dodging the shot and grabbing his gun in the process. Then both of them take aim at each other, and we get this scene where we're both just standing there. Then we get a cutscene that shows Sniper Wolf fall to the ground, and this shows that we just outclass one of the best snipers in the world in this game somehow. We head over to where her body is, and we get this cutscene where we talk to her a bit, and all of her wolves show up because they know she's dying. Octacon shows up, and he's like, Why? You didn't have to kill her. But then Sniper Wolf convinces him it's fine. He gives her her handkerchief back, and we place it over her face before we shoot her one last time to kill her. It's pretty sad, but I like the cutscene. The wolves all howl after this too, which adds to the emotions in the scene. We're able to go down into the blast furnace and get out of the cold for a little bit. This room just has some guards and a large area at the bottom with like lava or molten. Either way, if we fall into it, we die. Nothing really happens until we get to the freezer unit even further down in the ground. Once we enter the room, we get another cutscene, so these boss fights are starting to happen in rapid fire. When we walk in, we see a bunch of ravens flying around, and I think you can guess who's in the room with us. That's right, it's Vulcan Raven. This giant man is hanging out on the top of a shipment container. He's holding a massive minigun and jumps down from the shipment container. I'm pretty sure his legs would have given out on him. Maybe even broke his legs with all the weight coming down on him. Not only is he a big dude, but that gun has to weigh an absolute ton. This boss fight seems to be difficult at first, but it's actually a very simple boss fight. Raven walks around the room with all the shipment containers, and we have to sneak up behind him and shoot him with the rocket launcher. In the back. You just shoot him directly in the back with it. Or, if he turns and faces you, he'll shoot it down, and then he'll start doing damage to you. He does hit hard if you let him shoot you, but Snake is much faster than him, so it's really not that difficult. After shooting him a handful of times, he's defeated. Then we get a cutscene where he gives us information about what Liquid's plan is, that the DARPA chief was actually part of their posse or gang of bad guys, the one that we seen die, anyway. And then he allows for his ravens to eat him. I don't know how this works or if he's just some sort of supernatural being as well. It's something is all I can really say. Afterwards, we pick up a feather or something that just says Vulcan Raven. I have no idea what we're supposed to do with this. So if you know, let me know in the comments below what I should have done with it. This leads us to the room where the Metal Gear is at, finally. After all this searching, we come up to the control room where Ocelot and Liquid are hanging out talking about activating the Metal Gear. Then Snake is just sitting there listening, but is also being the loudest spy ever. He talks on the comm a bunch of times and even does a cartwheel flip to change sides. They would have heard him for sure. This helps move the story along though. We find out that there's three laptops in the control room that have to be turned off so that we can shut down the Metal Gear. And then Ocelot shoots the key out of our hand and it falls all the way to the bottom of the room. We have to run all the way back down there and get it out of the water. Then we come all the way back up to the control room and find out that Liquid and Ocelot have both left. We sneak in, put the key in the first computer to deactivate it. Then find out we need to freeze the key to change its shape and heat up the key to change its shape. This part was pretty annoying because I had to run all the way back to the freezer and then the furnace, wait for the key to change shape, and then run all the way back to the control room and put it in the right computer to deactivate it. So you don't have to suffer, but I did, so you're welcome. First we froze the key and came back, and then we heated the key and came back. Once we insert the heated key, we find out that we weren't deactivating the Metal Gear, but actually activating it. We were tricked because our master has been liquid the whole time, helping us along when actually he was using us because they didn't have the stuff they needed to activate the Metal Gear themselves. After we get out of the room, we see liquid walking around the corner, and we chase after him. Then, as he's walking on the railings, he's telling us about his plan, how we're brothers that were made from Big Boss's DNA, and that Solid Snake is the stronger of the two brothers, and he's the weaker one, and everything was handed to us and not him. 
Then, before we decide to take any type of shot on him, he gets into Metal Gear and causes everything to fall apart. And this leads into the boss fight with him, while he's in Metal Gear. For this being one of the final bosses of the game, it was really easy. So basically this fight has us shooting the Metal Gear with the Stinger, and then running from the missiles he shoots at us, and avoiding getting stepped on by the big mech. That's pretty much it. After we get his health all the way down, we get a cutscene where we're about to get stepped on, but the ghost ninja shows up and prevents the mech from stepping down with his super strength. And then we're able to get away for the moment. This is when a cutscene takes place where Snake and Grey Wolf are talking behind a crate and Liquid is just stomping around in the background. This would be the best time for him to try to kill us since we're just hanging out. Grey Wolf tells us that he's actually killed the family of one of the girls that's with the Colonel. I can't remember her name, but she said Big Boss was at fault or something, and he wants us to tell her the truth. Grey Wolf takes off and does some really cool moves with his sword to do some damage to the Metal Gear, but in the process loses his sword, gets his arm blown off, and gets crushed by the arm of the Metal Gear against the wall. He tells Snake to take the shot, but Snake can't do it, and then Grey Wolf ends up getting stepped on by the Metal Gear. And then he dies. Good job, Snake. You really crumbled under the pressure in that cutscene. This leads into part two of the Metal Gear fight, which is exactly the same as before, so I just will quickly sim over the fight because it's pretty boring that nothing changed with the fight. Pretty lame. This time in the cutscene we're able to actually destroy the Metal Gear with our Stinger missile and he comes crashing down in a blaze of fire. We get knocked out during this and when we wake up we're tied up and Liquid is there talking nonsense to us. This time he has Mera off to the side and says that we have to fight him hand to hand and see who the stronger brother is. We also find out that all the soldiers that the military were producing have the DNA of Big Boss injected in them to be super soldiers. And that were actually eight snakes, and they only let two live and got rid of the rest of them. Also, the military plans on destroying this fortress now, and have called in a drop to get rid of us, so we're on a limited time frame here. But we end up having to fight Liquid in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is the boss fight I've heard people say is very hard, but I was able to beat it first try, and honestly think it's one of the easier boss fights in this game. He just wants to hit you with combos, but if you stay on the offensive, then he can't really land any hits on Snake. About halfway through the fight, he starts doing this football tackle charge, but as long as you see it coming, which he has a pretty big tell, then you can avoid it and just hit him. When you knock him down, he'll try to do a leg sweep, but you just keep your distance. Overall, I think this fight was overhyped. The timer also doesn't really matter as long as you're being aggressive, you'll have plenty of time to take him down. Once we get his health all the way down, we get this really good fighting cutscene. We're pretty equally matched, so we're matching punches and kicks, we're jumping in the air and stuff, but Salt Snake gets the better liquid and is able to land a punch, I believe, and knocks him off the top of the Metal Gear, and he falls all the way to the ground. Finally, Liquid is dead. Now we have to get Meryl and get out of the fortress before they bomb it. We have an intimate moment with Meryl, and then we get dressed and leave the room to escape. The next part of this game is just an escape out of the building. We find a jeep that Meryl steals because the keys are inside of it, and we hop on the back and have a mounted machine gun. We just have to shoot enemies and barrels to clear the way out of the building. This is a bit difficult because we don't have any of our stuff that we had going into the boss fight, so we're basically defenseless besides the mounted gun. Anyways, we blow up a gate and make our way through the tunnels to escape. On our way out, guess who shows up behind us on his own little jeep thing? It's Liquid Snake. This dude will not die. He's made of pure metal or something. I don't know why he's so strong and just won't go away. This cutscene turns into a chase scene where we have to just shoot him. So he doesn't damage our jeep or us too much. It's a pretty simple fight and you can basically just keep shooting and nothing bad happens. After a little bit we get another really good cutscene where Liquid gets in front of us and tries to crash our jeep. We're trying to avoid him and then Snake does some more parkour stuff and avoids being shot somehow. I really like that his power and skills just meet no limits. 
were able to get close enough to him to land the three most massive headbutts in gaming history. They're so dramatic and I love them. Liquid then gets like knocked out and we're racing out of the tunnel and both of the jeeps end up crashing and rolling outside. Our jeep is also rolling right off the side of the cliff but stops just in time. We come to and help Meryl out of the driver's side. Bet you can't guess what happens next. Liquid steps out from behind the jeep. This dude is still alive. He's pretty beat up but he has a gun so we can't really do anything. He starts screaming our name and he gets hit with the heart attack that the early characters had at the beginning of this game and he falls to the ground. He's finally dead. Nope. He makes one last jump to his feet and tries to grab a hold of us until his body cannot take it anymore. And finally, after six boss exchanges with him, he's dead with the most dramatic stare down with Solid Snake. Then we get a call from the Colonel telling us that they called off the bombing on the fortress and that we're safe, and the Secretary of Defense was acting on his own, the President didn't know anything about it, so they could cancel the uh, bombing. The call ends, we take one last look at Liquid, and we head down the cliff and find a snowmobile. We get some cheesy dialogue between Snake and Meryl, get on the snowmobile to leave, and she gives us his ripped up headband, and Snake drives off with the snowmobile. Then the credits roll. There is some dialogue after the credits that I watch later on, but I don't have any footage, so I'm not going to include it, but something to keep in mind if you play the game yourself. This is a game I would recommend and might be my second favorite game we've played on this challenge so far. The story is really good, even though it's weird and the gameplay holds up pretty well. I would check this one out. If you want to know what's next, stick around, but if not, thanks for watching, and remember to subscribe, like, and share this video, and we'll see you in the next one. Alright, uh, okay, so we got our GameCube list up, and uh, we got a random number generator, we have 543 left, so on the count of three, we're going to figure out what we're playing next. So in three, two, one, 495. 495, 495, Top Angler, Real Bass Fishing. It's a real-time bass fishing simulator. I will have to figure out how this plays, if there is an actual way to finish this game. Well, that is what we're playing next, is Top Angler, Real Bass Fishing.